everyone. This is the Midweek Zap, and I'm Zara Altair. And today I'm so excited. We have Ronel, and he is coming to us live from a cafe. So there may be some ambient sounds, but his wisdom will still prevail. So welcome, everyone. Welcome, all the Zapsters. Welcome, new visitors. And Ronel, if you could. Tell everybody about yourself. And uh, Renell Smith, living outside of Dallas, Texas. Um, spend most of my days helping businesses be successful in the online marketing world. Helping is what I really, really, really enjoy doing. So uh, it's kind of right up my alley. And I, you know, I love content search. It's just a natural fit. So, and I love doing presentations and running my mouth because I love to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Primarily because talking is an extension of the, of the things I get to learn, or I call it still from people. So uh, I enjoy sharing it, which is kind of a part of a natural osmotic process, process I call it. So I like yeah, giving I that's I think that's true. And sharing information, the new information that you learn helps to internalize it inside yourself because you're putting it out there in the world. So you have um a uh, presentation today you want to introduce your presentation because it's all about brand loyalty getting those loyal followers communicating with them and i and i saw i had a sneak peek at the first slide which i just love <laughs> the word why is crossed out so tell us what you're going to tell us <laughs> uh, I, this this talk kind of came about uh and by accident was from talking to people, you know, a lot of times when I talk to people, I kind of have an agenda. I, I want them to kind of help me distill the ideas that are in my head. But what I found was most people don't have a clear idea of what why they should be producing content. They, they know they should. And if they do know, they don't clearly understand how it helps them in the long run. Or, or as I like to say, it's a little heavy handed um, why they should be producing content. So that's what I want to talk about today. You know, ultimately the goal should be with your content is to, to produce brand loyalty and content can help with that. But content, as I've said before, isn't, isn't the goal. Ultimately building brand loyalty, building a loyal community that will help you share and amplify that content is ultimately where you want to be able to get to if, if you're going to be successful at content marketing. Okay. And I think there's, there's a bottom line to it all. And that is that, you know, the real loyal community is a community who actually helps those dollars come in. That's the the real bottom line of being online with your business. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you're on a roll. Let's go. <laughs> okay. Let me share my screen and we'll get to it. Let me know when you can see it. You can see it. I can see it. With the cross out, I'm gonna bring it up here on the screen. There we go. Um, with the cross out, why? Yes. So <laughs> I begin by sharing a story. I did a talk in February in South Dakota. Was talking to a gentleman uh, from California. Was uh, now in the building a head of a startup incubator, basically in in uh, in South Dakota, in Sioux Falls. And he was talking to me about he had a problem. The problem was he had a ginormous community, but he didn't know what what content to share and I was like oh my gosh that's a problem yeah. and I started basically talking to him about how if you have an audience you have a loyal community then you can use those people to help you produce content whether they're producing it themselves or they're amplifying it for you they can inform that process and so as we're talking a gentleman walks by and he says that guy's a millionaire he's only 27 years old so I'm immediately thinking I need to, I need to meet that guy so he starts telling the story as the guy walked up, that this guy was uh, was a tech guy who really didn't know where he, his career was going, really didn't have any ideas around things he wanted to do, but he realized he was really good at helping people. And so what he did was he found out that um, there was a group of uh, people who were interested in finance. They, they wanted to aggregate the content. These are mainly older people, retirees. They wanted to aggregate their financial information where they, where they could go online at any given point and find out how well um, you know their portfolios are doing. How, how well the you know the markets were doing, and so what he did was he created an algorithm. The, the, I say very simple to him. It was simple that allowed tens of thousands of people to get this information very easily. And so he had a very simple online sign up, and that sign up um, he amassed an email list of, of a couple hundred thousand. 
and this was again just basically going out and finding out what, what type of information people want. And of those couple of hundred thousand, twenty thousand pay him nine dollars and ninety nine cents a month. So you do the math, he's amassing a fortune monthly for for pretty simple information. And that was basically not by him deciding to share content, but him listening to an audience, a group of people who knew what they wanted, they just didn't know how to get it. So that's that's what I want to talk about today is ultimately what you want to do is, is build a community because uh, you don't have to work so hard to to produce and or amplify your content. Okay. Uh, why is, oh, okay. And to me, it, I, I like to say it, it begins from within. The, the content pr production process has been so muddled. People are so stuck on, you know, here's the content I need to be producing. The fo first thing you want to focus on is who do I have to build a passionate base around? And this is a, a, is a graphic of Steve Jobs when he left um, Apple for the first, oh, he was ousted from Apple for the first time. He started with this really, really passionate team who didn't know where they were going next. But they, they, they knew they wanted to produce a company. They end up uh, thinking they were going to produce, uh, start a, t a computer company, which they did. It wasn't very successful. But the passion, if you read, read about this team, the passion this group began with was so easy to distill it made it. It made anybody who they hired on later in this computer company, whether in sales and finance, accounting, whatever, it made people feel like you know we know where they're going and we want to get behind this. And so, so my message there is, it begins from within. Your content production, content amplification, your content marketing efforts begin with the a strong internal team who can help you distill that that message of passion that we're going places and you need to be on this ship. And that comes out when when you're producing content. The next thing is, and I, Peter Thiel has been in, on the news a lot lately, but he his book uh, Zero to One really really opened my eyes to something that a lot of us don't think about. And, and what that is is, content should begin as as a solitary process. Meaning, here's what how I want to help people. Then it begins. Here's how here's the content I need to be producing to help those people. Then you begin a one to one relationship, and ultimately you go from content to one to one relationship. To audience to community but it begins very very small and I think sometimes we forget that and so what I like to say to people is, is very similar to what Peter Thiel says here he, he talks a lot about he won't invest in a company that hasn't focused on he hasn't perfected a really really tiny target market first because unless you learn how to serve that tiny tiny target market which is one-to-one -to, -one to audience to community you don't you don't you'll never be properly um, you, you never have the proper sea legs, so to speak, to inform the content to realize what it is that you need to be producing for a larger group. And most people want the widest base possible when they start producing content, and that's actually a mistake. You want to learn as much as you can from that small group of just a handful of people very, very early on, and then use that to inform the process as you as you uh, get your content marketing sea legs. That's a huge mistake people make. And, and the simple fix is just get in, you know, shake people's hands, get in people's faces, and find out what, what it is you you have a problem with, and then discern how you're uniquely qualified to help them solve those problems. The other is is what I just talked about, and I, I'll continue to beat this drum forever because I've seen the value of uh, going, thinking beyond the audience. And what I like to say is, you know, an audience is what happens beyond the one to one connection. You have a people, you have a group of people who understand your brand to a degree, understand where you're going, but they're not necessarily loyal yet. And so ultimately what you want to do is is move them from audience to community. So if you think of you know 20,000 people, only 10% of those people may be loyal. And actually what we see now, it's actually much, much smaller than that. And this is a graphic from uh, Buffer. And Buffer came out last year and said that they, they had lost a ton of their social traffic. And they felt like it had to do, they really didn't understand why, but they felt like it had to do with more and more people were choosing not to visit their blog, choosing not to engage with their content. And what I think, and, and this is this is a total guess, I think they never focused on building, going beyond audience. They had, quote unquote, a loyal community, or what they call a loyal community, but I think that was people who, who just knew Buffer, um, were loyal to that, quote unquote, content, until other competitors jumped in and started producing similar content, and they didn't give people a reason to come back. And if you look at this graphic, it, it really highlights what Rebel Mr. Road. You know, less than two percent of the people will share and interact with your content. And these are these are active visitors. 
And that's what I think Buffer ran into was they, they had, you know, thousands and thousands of shares on their website. There was, you know, hundreds of people, you know, there were dozens of people that were commenting continually. But those people weren't, quote unquote, loyal to that brand's content. Many of them were loyal to Buffer. I, I do believe that, but I don't think people were loyal to that brand's content. And what happened there is, and, and we tend to miss this, if you focus on content loyalty, meaning I'm going to overserve the people who consume my content, they feel like, you know what, I'm happy, I'm not going anywhere else. And that's what I, I, I think this all this emphasis on 10x content, and you need, to do, you need to be better in this and better in that. If you focus on getting the people and retaining them by continuing focusing on over-serving them, not just meeting their needs, but over-serving them, I think this, this engagement rate goes up significantly because they aren't looking at other platforms. They feel like you're the de facto resource. And this, this is a graphic that Buffer um, has shared for years. It's been all around the internet. But ultimately, we have to stop thinking about content as this heroic effort. Content's not going to save your brain. In many cases, in, in every case, content's an addendum to your product or service. It can help you. But when people consume your content, people can get engage with your brand, they're ultimately looking to become better than they, they were before. And so this graphic you know, kind of highlights that you know, a person interacts with your product or service, and you enable them to do better what they already endeavor to do. They're not going to wake up and be able to jump off a cliff just because they consumed your content, and that's a huge mistake. And that doesn't mean you continue to work hard to, to create great content, whether through design and all those elements, but you want to focus on what, what can I do with my product or service, because a, product or, a crappy product or service is not going to be helped by amazing content. It, it begins with an amazing product or service and your content can help people be better today than they were yesterday. And so this is this is a graphic I talk about all the time and it's very, very significant in, in that the solutions we provide often don't hit the target because we're not in sync with what a customer's uh, needs are. And that comes from not having those conversations, from not focusing on, you know, what are they really trying to solve here? And, and Leo Ganeva uh, kind of hit the nail on the head when he talked about people don't buy a quarter inch bit, they want a quarter inch whole. And that's so, so true. When somebody goes to Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever whatever store they, to get something that's helped them solve their problem, it's not the tool that's the solution. You know, it's the solution that's the solution. And we have to get beyond that, you know, my whether it's my product or my service or my content being the, the problem solver. And what I love about that is many times I'll talk to people and, and I'll say, you know what? Well, what problem can I solve for you? And they're like, well, I don't, I don't have a problem. And what I found very simply is, how can we find the solution together? Now, again, if they need a solution, they obviously have a problem, but just that little bit of phrasing makes all the difference in the world. It's, it's very, very significant. In other words, being human, I, I talk about this all the time. It's something I didn't fully appreciate, but it makes a huge deal. People more easily connect with a person than they do just words uh, on a page or, or an image. And this is a uh, one that means something to me. I'm a huge uh, uh, blender nut in that because I make a lot of smoothies. And will it blend this commercial for Blendtec blenders? Blenders got in my um, my wheelhouse a couple of years ago when I was looking for a blender, and I couldn't find any one that would. Uh, I wanted something that would grind anything. Well, well what is what does this commercial talk about? Will it blend? It'll blend pretty much anything up to metal, iPhones, marbles. It, why that got in my wheelhouse was I had realized that the nemesis for making smoothies was frozen fruit. I did all this exploration, experiment, and talking to people, and everybody said, if you can find something that, that can chop up frozen strawberries because the sugar makes them so tight, so compact when they're frozen, it's like chopping up a brick. If you find something that will chop those up, you, you, you have your solution. I went online, saw this thing grinding up iPhones and marbles, and I was like, will it blend? Absolutely. It'll blend strawberries. And so... I connected with this brand, though, because of this goofy guy, the CEO, who's always chopping things up. But we can do similar things with our content. We can answer that core problem that, that um, people are searching for a solution for. You know, that puts you in their wheelhouse. That helps them. You, you become the de facto resource that they're looking for. And, and when we talk about loyalty, that's where it begins, when you help them out They'll look to you again when they have a problem. And then hopefully you become, quote, unquote, and I, I know I say this a lot, but, but it means a lot to me. You become that 
de facto resource where you're the person, your blog is the spot, your your writing, your words, your information is the resource that they come back to. And that's the same way for this this website. I don't visit it frequently, but if I was looking for a blender, I'd stay on this website. I think about what Moz has done. You know, they have an inanimate object in, in Roger Mozbach. But you know, people come from thousands of miles away from you know outside the country to to hug Roger at all the events. So to see him, take a picture with him, and we can do very similar things with our with our our not, not just our blog with, with the logo or design, but having a subject matter expert or having someone, whether an inanimate object or an actual person, that people can associate with, associate your brand's content with, then that goes a long, long way. Again, um, people love Roger Mossbot, and there's nothing to stop your brand from having something very similar. It could be a person. Now, there's the, the light with with uh, Content and interaction. This this is a this is a, a big one. I don't see it done often enough. And whenever I talk to people, it's very very frustrating that that there's so much low hanging fruit they leave on the table. The example I love to use is Hilton suggests. This is a uh, Twitter for a basically an answering service. What um, Hilton has all these people basically concierges all across the country that are on um, uh, Hilton does on Twitter that are answering questions that people have. On Twitter, the cool thing about this is these people, oh, these people are not staying at Hilton. These are people in these cities where they have concierges because they have hotels, and they're answering questions around travel. They're answering questions around hotels. They're answering questions around staying in the city. And what this does is that this is that initial touch where you're online, you ask your friends a question on Twitter, Hilton jumps in, and you're like, wow. I'm not even standing at Hilton. They're answering the question for me. And this is that getting in front of getting people in front of people's face for the first time. This again puts you front and center. It, it highlights something that a lot of co the competition is not doing. It's not really scalable for a lot of other brands, and it's not. It, it's it's kind of uh, pushing other brands out of the space, so to speak, because it's not like every hotel needs to do this when you when you already have somebody in the city. This is so huge because it highlights empathy. It highlights a, a brand putting. The needs of the customers go for their own, and this is a huge deal to me because one of the things I talk about is when we're producing content, we should focus on value to audience and as opposed to value to brand. This empathic move by Hilton has a tremendous amount of value to the audience, and I'm sure it has some intrinsic value to the brand. But it's obvious that it impacts the audience in a, in a very significant way. I want to I want to just um, comment on that because I think it's. I think it's so incredibly important. And um, when you're looking at at doing that, because I'm sure a lot of like solopreneurs are like, you know, how can I do that? I can't hire a whole team to go bopping in on Twitter whenever somebody mentions something. But um, I I think that if you if you take your content and really do what Ranel's talking about, which is answering those core questions. They may or may not, not, may not be, you know, spot on with your product or service, but it's one of the answers that they really need. That they really need attention. Attention. Okay, sorry, I just. Okay, sorry, I just. No, no, you're fine. I and I, I, I totally agree. Because again, we have to find some way to insert ourselves into their lives, and that's often not the most difficult, not the easiest thing to do. Another example, and I love, love, love this. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a car person. I'm mainly a Porsche person. I'm hoping to own one one day. But um, Mercedes Benz did something really cool last year when, um, or recently when BMW was celebrating their hundredth birthday, they went on their Twitter. And said, you know, congratulations, you know, here's to another hundred years of competition. And that really got in people's wheelhouse because, you know, it's not like people who uh, follow Mercedes Benz aren't BMW fans. Many, many of these people who follow BMW or, yeah, follow Mercedes Benz or just car enthusiasts or uh, performance enthusiasts. And so them seeing a brand tout the competition is so unifying. I can imagine a lot of people who are BMW fans who saw this retweeted, who, who maybe saw this, uh, their friends talking about this, all of a sudden started sharing Mercedes-Benz content. 
And if you're not loyal to either brand, imagine all of a sudden maybe you like being Mercedes Benz more than you did before. I know for me personally, I don't have any dollars in the hunt. I, I respect Mercedes Benz as a brand even more because of it. And this is another example of using the audience, using your community to, to produce content. This this information was out there. This stuff happens all the time. And there's nothing to stop uh, brands, content marketing brands, even small SMBs from doing something similar. You know, say you're a cupcake shop in the coffee shop down the street, celebrates this 10th anniversary. What's to stop you from having a discount in its honor or, you know, tweeting something out, sharing something, posting a picture on Instagram. These are all the things we, we, could, we could be doing. This is the way we have to be thinking to be successful at content marketing. Another is, you know, use content to promote loyalty. And I use loyalty a lot because my, my eyes were, were open to this uh, based on a study that Parsley did. Parsley is a, a platform uh, used by the publishing world to uh, an analytics platform. And so what they did, they analyzed thousands of websites, billions of pages, and what they found that of those websites, only about 10, 11% of the people who read those blogs or read those pages were considered loyal. And these were big, big, platforms, I'm sorry, these are big publications, online publications. What's significant about that, they loyal as 11, uh, I'm sorry, those 11% is visiting once or more in 30 days. And for most of us, if we had that, I know for a lot of my size, I, I, I'd be content. But for most people, that's going to be, a very 11% is going to be a very significant number, whether you think it's high or low. But what it highlights is an opportunity. When you say once per 30 days, only 11%, you're like, ah, oh, that's not a big deal unless you have, you know, millions and millions of pages and million, millions and millions of followers. And you know, that equates to probably tens of thousands of viewers a, a week or a month. The great thing about that is imagine in your vertical that this number is 5% loyal. Because we're talking about, you know, publishing platforms, um, yeah, publishing companies. Imagining, imagine in your vertical, whether it's plumbing or, or attorney or uh, doctor's offices. Imagine it's 5%. If you can get 11% uh, loyalty per month, content loyalty, people coming to your website to view your content per month, that means you're outpacing the competition if you can get it to 20 or 25 or whatever or whatever it is in your vertical. So then your job now becomes, what is it that helps produce content loyalty? And so you, you want to start doing things like looking at the types of content that you can produce um, you know, whether it's visuals, whether it's infographics, whether it's videos, whether it's simple text, whether it's just answering a question, whether it's a how-to, your job is now to, to tweak, to try to find what increases the loyalty on your blog. And so the first, that begins with you saying, what percentage of the, the uh, viewers are loyal now? What percentage of loyal viewers you need? Meaning, what would move the needle for your brand? Is it 20%, is it 20 as defined by visitors per week or per, per month or two months or whatever your job is to, is to come up with that metric and then optimize the hell out of it by finding what it is they're responding to and again it, it begins with simple content type uh, tweaking those changing those moving those around and it, it could be a weekly thing you could do a, a text blog this this month or with this week a, a webinar an infographic a guest post and to find whatever it is that that helps create that loyalty this is another point that I don't find that, that when I make it, I found that I'm not enough people to think about it. We've all heard about content curation, but I think this is a L'Oreal site that is highlighting content that falls in three categories, flair, artistry, artistry, and beauty. The cool thing about this is the content that, that they're curating on this website is not just theirs. I mean, it's, it's from competing brands, whether Maybelline or what, what are the other, uh, Women focused fashion brands or uh, luxury brands. The great thing about that is this basic basically amounts to content curation, but they're displaying other co brands' content prominently on their website. The great thing about that is they're going to get the impact from that from a, a, a the domain level, because if you're saying okay, I'm going to highlight other brands' content, that means the eyeballs are going to your website and not theirs. So you know you can take a, they can take a Maybelline product or whatever brand's product, do a video about it, write a blog about it, and all of a sudden, bam, they're getting the organic lift from that on their website. And these are the types of things anybody can do. Again, you don't want to help a, a, a competitor; you want to make sure it helps your brand even more, at least. But the key is think 
beyond just your website. Think beyond just your brand. How how can your how can your brand organically tie in content from whether the competition or um, products and services outside your vertical, but that, that may be very similar. And the example I use, you know, say you're a coffee shop, and instead of just writing about your coffee shop, you write about coffee shops in other cities, or you know, use um, yeah, something you learned from a coffee shop you saw in another country or another state. But use that content on your website to enhance your domain, to enhance your authority. It goes a long way. And again, it just amounts to you finding the types of content that'll resonate. Um, you know, if you look at the L'Oreal site I just showed, they have a lot of videos. Um, but for your, bl your blog, your website, you want to say, okay, what types of content should I be optimizing if my goal is loyalty? What's helping me become loyalty? If I'm curating various types of content, what, what performs best? And then continue to optimize for it. This is another tool. Maman's just came up with this. Um, we've, we've, I've been using BuzzSumo for a long time. If you haven't tried it, I highly recommend it. But BuzzSumo um, gives you a, a great snapshot of some of the best performing content across the web. Now Moz has a very similar tool that can highlight for you before you start producing content. In my vertical, what is the highest performing content? And then it, it highlights for you, okay, what's the domain? What specific pieces of content? What type of content it was? What was it most prominently shared? And so what that does, it informs the process. It lets you know what I should be doing before I ever start producing anything. And that goes a long way because one of the biggest problems we have in content marketing is what content should I be producing? And as I like to say, that's not a problem we should be having. If you're stuck at what content I should be producing, you're probably not doing something right, or at least you're not looking at the full picture. And, and so I, start, I think we have to start thinking holistically and say, okay, what are some of the tools that can help us? So Moz Content, uh, if you can find it at moz.com or buzzsumo, B-U-Z-Z-S-U-M-O.com. Uh, give, those, give those tools a try. At, at least they can, they can help you in this uh, often challenging content marketing world. I want to say something is, about that. Oh. That is, whoa, you know, you have a business, you have a brand, how can you not think of content? I never understood that. And it's like, you know, it's like things, services that offer you, you know, like um, content topics for your blog or something like that. And I'm like, no, I don't want generic content. I want to talk about my brand, whatever it is. And, and that, you know, the passion that you talked about early on, you know, if you don't have that pa if you have that passion, there's no problem coming up with stuff to share. Oh and, my God, that that is so true. And anyway, I just wanted to interject that, and we have a whole bunch of comments and stuff, but I'll let you continue on. And okay, I'm we'll always I'm on. And we'll and so um, an another thing, and we don't talk enough about this, and and you notice my voice changed there because I get so frustrated by this, but. I run the, the uh, user-generated content blog for Moz, uh, which is called UMoz. And so we have a lot of people that produce content for us. And that's people at all levels, you know, from, from content strategists to content people to, S, uh, to SEOs to CEOs to CFOs. And the great thing about that is they're producing content that hopefully enhances their brand or their brand's reputation because it'll appear on the Moz blog. But we use in the audience to produce the types of content that the audience wants and needs. So, you know, I bet that we have an editorial team that helps vet the content based on what our audience wants, which is, you know, how to actionable content. But the audience itself is producing that content. And that goes right back to how this began when I talked about if, if you listen to the audience, they'll in, help inform you of the types of content they're most receptive to. And so, you know, I look at, look at what Moz has done and, and what other um, blogs and other industries are doing, but not enough in our industry, is if you focus on the needs of the community and not the needs of the brand, you can end up with some amazing content, some amazing relationships, some amazing, amazingly powerful domains if, if you're forcing people to, or if you're asking people to produce and share their best content on your blog. And, but that comes from you being challenging, from, from you being a, having a reputation for excellence, from, from you 
producing excellence on your blog in the first place. And them recognizing, you know what, if I want to write for this blog, I'm going to have to bring it. And then everybody benefits because of it. But we have to stop thinking about just the content we can produce because most of us, we only have so much bandwidth. And we have to start thinking about, okay, how can we help out, help others by helping ourselves? And again, it begins with helping others while helping ourselves, not helping ourselves and maybe help others. And I think that's 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 what we miss out on sometimes in content. Marketing. We get selfish, and that includes me. We lose that whole help ethic. And content marketing should be about help. That's that's where it should begin. But we don't see enough of that now. Now it, it becomes all about the messenger. Uh, um, too often, uh, the message is about the messenger, and we have to focus on uh, as as messengers and those in the message that we deliver on who we're delivering it to and how we're able to help them. And that's where it should begin and end. And so, you know, I wrote a blog a, a while back for Salesforce.com. Kite Desk is a very similar platform uh, that's that's in a similar vertical that works with Salesforce. And so they asked to use my blog on their platform. So this is this is another form of, of quote unquote guest posting that basically amounts to them using a blog from a, a high high ranking domain that did well, but they're using my blog on their website now. Um, because Salesforce, uh, I guess the agreement is that they don't, uh, as long as the content's original on their blog first, and Kite Desk just needed content. So they, they looked and said, hey, this blog is really doing well. It would work for us in our vertical. This isn't a competitor of ours. It actually helps us from an authority standpoint to have a post that appeared on Salesforce. So they reached out to me, reached out to Salesforce, and now it's on their blog. People, nobody who reads this blog cares where it came from. They care that the information, they can find this information on their blog. So this gives fodder for Kite Desk to send out in a newsletter. It gives fodder for them to help their sales staff on the types of questions that they may be getting or that they may get from people in the audience and the community that they're serving. And they have content on their website. They have fresh content on their website that they didn't have to produce. They just had to pay a little for it. Another thing is we, we have to focus on from a community standpoint, creating what's called 10x content. And that's basically, to my, to my mind, uniquely valuable, unique and uniquely valuable, valuable content you couldn't find anywhere else in content that is unique to, to that audience, meaning they're only going to come to you for that because they can only find it there. That once they know you offer it, they're going to continue to come back to you for it. And that basically means that how I want us to get there is I want us to think in terms of Whatever we produce, it's going to be the best in class. If it's an infographic, it's, it's going to be like in, unlike anything else you've seen, uh, the audience has ever seen in the world. If, if it's going to be online in any shape, form, or fashion, it's not going to be readily available except for on your blog or wherever you choose to share it. We're, we're only going to produce things that we know have unique value, that it's never been said or done in a way that you choose to do it. And that's what you become a 10x brand means because ultimately it's not about producing 10x content and I think a lot of us are getting that wrong including myself early on it's about you becoming a 10x brand meaning that everywhere you go everything that you do everything your brand touches is seen as top top quality top in class and this is a, a quote from one of my favorite SEOs this is Eric Inga of Stone Temple Consulting and he said this a while back that um, Building a passionate community is ultimately where we have to go, and that passionate community has to has to believe in you, has to has to defend your thoughts and beliefs, and, and march alongside you too. Is the way that I see it. it and, and, but that only comes if they know you have their interest at heart, that you help them, that you didn't you didn't just you know show up one day with 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 an offer of help. You you actually showed up and helped them without asking for anything. You didn't focus on building a community or an audience. You just focus on doing the things that would ultimately lead to to, to building it, going from audience to community. But it began with with you, just you helping, and then as you move forward, they move forward with you in lockstep. And that passion is what enables ultimately enables brands to be successful. Again, we, we have to think in terms of we don't just want to share content. We don't want to create one to one connections. We don't just want to uh, build an audience or community. Ultimately, what we want. An extension of that community is loyal advocates for our brands. And those aren't people who just buy our products. Those are people that are telling other people about our products. But we have to retain them in the community for that to happen. And ultimately, what it comes down to, the reason why you should, should build a loyal community is they'll fight for you. When you build a loyal community, you use your content 
to build a loyal community, when you think beyond yourself, those people will help sustain your brand. They'll 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 sustain you through the ups and downs, and they'll be there for you the way you you were there for them. Thank you. Super. Oh, that was that was really fantastic. So we've got. I want to go through some of the comments and responses here because um, people are getting very involved. Um, Whoops, I lost my place here in the comment tracker. Okay, um, first of all, Omi Sido, hi Omi, um, recommended another book which is called Return on Relationship by Ted Rubin. So I thought I'd just, Nessa, have you read that at all? No, I've never read that one. I'm sorry, I've stopped reading. Okay. I've, never, I've never read that one. Um, I, <laughs> Weirdly, and I'm sure that's not a content marketing book either. I, I try to read a lot, a lot of business books, and my efforts are, uh, my interests are really, really diverse. But I do focus on books that will better enable me to be successful in relationships. So that sounds like one I should check out. Yeah, yeah. And then Omi also said, I love this. What I'm getting here is show empathy to get loyalty. Yes. And I know empathy is such a overused word. But what we have to be willing to do is, is put ourselves in front of that truck, so to speak. And I know giving, giving, giving without the, the expectation of anything coming back is a foreign concept in, in this selfie-obsessed world. But I had a talk last night with about 20 business executives here in my, my uh, area, a lot of them were in tech, uh, and venture capital. capital. I said, the more I focus on taking myself out of the equation, the more I've said, the more I focus on on just helping other brands, the more I've been successful. And I realized, you know, for a few years ago when it was like, okay, here's what I need to do to be successful. And it was just me being in a way. And now it's like, you know, I'll, I'll flat out tell people, I, you don't need to hire me. It's not that I don't need business, but I don't care if you hire me. I want to learn from this interaction. I, I want to be better for, for the conversation. I, I want to pass along information to you because this symbiotic relationship is going to help me inform my process. So I'm going to gain something either way. But it comes from being empathic. It comes from me, me saying, if, if you need help, let me help you. I'm not going to worry about whether you'll pay me. Yeah, and then Omi, Omi said, uh, uh, right along with you, active listening and engaging with your customers' perspectives, the highest ROI on your market research. Absolutely. The best one of the best pieces of information I ever got was, um, and I think we, we sometimes poo-poo this concept uh, by listen to the to the wrong quotes but it never hurts to ask questions i my second job out of college was as a uh, well first job out of college basically was a newspaper reporter and so i got really good at asking questions and what i learned was being a reporter was nothing but a license to learn all the things i wanted yeah whether in business or in life so i could just call somebody up if I had a question and ask them and they, they would always answer it honestly because they felt like I was going to do right by them in, in distilling it in the right way. But I, I think if, if, if we, we, we do more of that reporting and researching and finding out, okay, what, what really are the needs of, of the audience, the, the needs of the community, and then serve that up in uh, the most palatable way, that's, that's when we're on our way to being, you know, building a 10x brand. Yeah, and then uh, We Wake in London says, Brand loyalty for me means someone who is willing to put up with inconvenience to buy and support the product, irrespective of the price. And then he says, thank you. I am postponing eating my dinner to watch this midweek zap. So loyal to your brand, Sarah. <laughs> what did oh you guys think about that? <laughs> oh my gosh, that is awesome. But I tell you what, he hit the nail on the head. Because one of the things I say all the time, and, and, I, and I love this, and, and that most people, most content marketers are not sharing this enough. We hear all the time, you have to be amazing. But at first, you have to be in the way, in that you have to insert yourself in the people's lives in some meaningful way. Not, not just as a disruption, as an interruption, but in some meaningful way. Hey, how but from there, we have to think in terms of what, when we build that relationship, if somebody screws up, you know, if I go to a store and they don't have something I want, I don't, because I love that store, or I love that coffee shop, I don't say, hey, I'm going to go somewhere else. It's when they haven't begun just in an eruption, when they just, it just stops there. And I think about, you know, I, I have, I'm loyal to 
to a, a couple of hotel brands. And if I go there and I don't have an amazing experience, it's still going to be positive because I'm going to say, you know, nobody's perfect. But if it's if it's a hotel that I have a, just a good stay and I'm not really loyal to them, and I go there and I have a bad stay and I'm like, wow, I'll never stay here again. So we have to focus on going beyond just the interruption, or just the insertion and, and just the helping to making people feel like, you know what, I'm going to foster this relationship. I'm going to continually be there for you. If I don't have the answer, I'll, I'll help find it. And that's one of the things I like to say. I say all the time to even people who end up hiring me, I probably don't have the answer, but but I have a community of, of friends that, that can help me find it. That's right. And this community is so, so important. Okay, now we have a question for you. Uh -oh. and, yep. This is from Kristen Drysdale. She said, I created a character for right tag, but only used in images unofficially and twice. Question. Do you think that a brand mascot can take off when started like that? Or does it need to be something that is officially declared? I think a brand mascot could work either way. So I think it could, but, but I think we have to think about uh, a more natural insertion. You know, when we look at these, these mascots that have been successful, they weren't forced. They just, they just were kind of were hanging around. And over time, as the brand became more popular, that mascot became more popular. As the brand became more sought out, the mascot became more sought out. So it has to be a natural extension of the brand. And, you know, people have talked about for years, that happens with the logo. You know, you think about the Coke logo or, or the AT&T logo or the Microsoft logo. You feel a certain way about it. But, but it, it's part and parcel of that brand. You know, if you love Coke, when I see that the silhouette of that bottle, I say, oh my gosh, it's such a positive association. It's, you know, similar to a mascot for me. So much so that, you know, you go to people's houses and you'll see those Coke bottles on the shelf and it's like, oh my gosh, it's, you know, it's like a little little tiki person or something. So I absolutely I think it can work, but but I think what 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 I would want to see her do more is is naturally insert it in her content. You know, have it displayed uh, on maybe a, on a, a banner on Google Plus or Twitter or whatever, and then use it when she's sharing content, when she's sharing others' content. You know, one of the things I I would do honestly, if I was going to create a mascot, I create a mascot. So even when I tweeted other people's content. I'd have it as an image that I could pull in from Buffer, and that would be like an insignia for my brand, but I'm sharing other people's content. Or use use a tool like um, Buffer's Pablo, where you know you you create this this little mock-up, this this little uh, card, so to speak, that you share on Twitter, and you have your logo at the bottom, and you have somebody else's tweet at the top, and then over time, as you build your social following, which I mean, Kristen has doesn't have to build a social following, as she's, but as she shares content. That logo continues to share uh, to show up. It, you know, it appears in pro presentations, and then after a while, she can have dolls or whatever, whatever, um, or whatever shachis, whatever you say that word, shachis, um that she wants can be depicted. Can be depicted there. Oh, fantastic answer! Thank you so much. And then Michael Shane David says. Websites run without a passion for content are akin to selling brightly colored soda pops and dark bottles. Content in a site is the top, is the, the pop, and the bottle served in all clarity crystal. I, it's so true. But, but I think a lot of people don't with that because they're so afraid of content. You know, it goes back to you know, people are afraid to be human. I, I get that all the time. Brands are afraid to be human. But then people are almost afraid to be empathic. You know, we, we live in this, again, selfie of self obsessed world where if you're not, what am I, what am I going to get out of it? But if we approach it from the standpoint, okay, what do I need to do to help you? You know, like you, you kind of, you define the limits to which you'll go to help somebody. And then when you produce a piece of content, you can say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to give everything away, but I'm going to give a lot away. But people need to see you being human. People need to, need to see you extending yourself on your block. People need to see some energy. Uh, you know, one of the things I've struggled with is in social is I've always liked to say that I'm boring. You know, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just a simple country guy. But, you know, you have to show some personality. You have to be willing to extend yourself. You have to be willing to put yourself out there. And when I look at, uh, I always check out, especially uh, small to medium-sized brands, 
that I kind of admire and I'll go to their blog and I'm like how could you not show more personality it's it's like to his point it's it's like this you know colored liquid in a dark bottle that nobody can see it's only when when they interact in person and they're not going to meet everybody who who need their product or service and that that's very frustrating yep and then we have a comment um, from Omi who says your branding campaign should be focused on intimacy and proximity in order to produce influence I, I you know I, I've I've started becoming a follower or following more closely local SEO in thinking about how to better serve the people closest to me. And so I've kind of used my own community to as, as kind of this intimate base in, in that they're, they're close to me, but I want to be more intimate with them or I'm going to, I'm seeking out interactions where I can get to know the people close to me even better. So what I'm going to, what I'm doing there is learning from those people who are going to have very similar needs to the people that are ultimately my, my clients and customers who will likely not be in my community. So like the interaction I had last night with the 20 business leaders, I'm learning from them without any regard for, for whether I'll um, get, ever get any business. As, as I said to them, I didn't even bring any cards. I'm not looking for business. I just want the conversations. I just want to learn. But the biggest thing, I started the conversation by saying, I'm here to help. If there's something I can help with, I'm not worried about getting business from it because if I can help you in some way, I'm, that's part of my larger story that I can use to, to help um, not only those that are proximal to me that are in my area, but people throughout the world, including online. Yep, and Kristen uh, said, Aww. thank you so much. Oh, she's so thoughtful, sweet. Thorough and thoughtful answer. Yeah, Kristen. She's so sweet. I've never met her. She seems like an awesome person. She is. She's just delightful. I've known her, what, three years, Kristen? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. She's just so much fun. And she is, boy, talk about passion, huh? Yep, yep, yep. yep. <laughs> Every time I've interacted with her, that that so comes. Well, two things come through with her: uh, passion and a sincere thirst for learning. Yes. Um, I love, love, love. I, I, that's something I, I. It's sad when people lose it. Um, but that's. I always tell people that's my saving grace. If, if it weren't for a sincere thirst for learning, I'd still be in fifth grade. <laughs> I was. I, 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 I should have. If, if I wasn't an avid reader, I'd still be in fifth grade. I. I should have failed fifth grade. I, I, I was just a good test taker, and um, I had teachers who cared about my parents who cared about me. Uh, I love learning, but I didn't love learning schoolwork at the time. But it was a, I've always, always had a sincere thirst for learning, and learning all things thoroughly. Um, that's so. I, I, I hope I pass that along to my kids. Yeah, I know. Even as an adult, if I want to learn something new, I start with the uh, children's books about it. Until I feel like I graduate to the adult books, you know, but they always have the basic principles. So yeah. even if it, yeah. if it goes from anything from learning to handle a tool to intellectual concepts, but you know, if it's something brand new to me, that's always been my strategy. Because if you try to dive into the adult books right away, you're like, oh, you know, I'll never get this. But if you go someplace where it's broken down simply, and I think this has to do with, you know, content too, is that, you know, to get people involved, you don't, I know I've posted often about, you know, using your own abbreviations or, you know, industry insider abbreviations like CRM and, you know, all that stuff. To somebody new or a new business owner, that is just, you know, another language and you're not being clear to them. So it really helps when you're introducing people to your business product or service that you are clear and concise and don't try to show off how smart you are by using insider words and abbreviations because it it puts them off it doesn't bring them in yeah. put it as simply I, I love that word conciseness I probably have a tense tattoo that's it, it'd be concise although I'm not very concise when I write and talk but I always tell people that if you if you're pitching someone by or you know, when of the thousands of blogs I see every year um, on Moz, the shorter the better. Because if you can't say it well, saying it long isn't going to help you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so 
So I think we have, to, we have to focus on doing well, doing better, what we endeavor to do a lot. And I always use the example of a runner. I, I meet so many people who are like, oh, I want, I want to run a marathon. I never ran before. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That, that didn't add up. Oh, no, I read, I read Runner's World. And they said you can prepare for a marathon in 17 weeks. And I'm like, okay, okay, let me, let me get this right. So the majority of the people who were running marathons have, have been running for years. But you want to run a marathon, and you think it's a good idea to do so after 17 weeks of training. Okay, it makes sense to me. But we do the same thing in content marketing. And to use your, your learning example, Think about if you don't get multiplication in third grade, even if you're a whoop student and they, you know, you, you get to fifth grade and, and the concepts build on one another. It all depends on how well you learn the basics. You may be able to get through fifth grade math, sixth grade math, seventh grade math. When you get to algebra and you don't know multiplication on the back of your hands, you will not be able to pass. You certainly won't be able to take a test and do well. So the same thing we, we have to be willing to do with content marketing is, is to say there, there is a place to start. And the first place to start is not by reading blogs, actually. It's not by reading books. It's to become an active participant in this community. This community is so amazing. You can ask questions, whether on core, on at the bottom of somebody's blog, after you've consumed their content. Well, you begin that learning process by simply interacting, because you don't have anything to contribute at that point. But don't focus on that. Your goal shouldn't be contribution. Your goal should be to, to, to be a sponge because this community will give you what it, what you need to be successful. And so I, I like to say that there is a there is a uh, progression path of progression, but there is a, there is a starting point, and that starting point is understanding that your contribution is through learning at first. You know what? We have gone way over time, but this is oh, sorry such an excellent, <laughs> excellent discussion. I want to thank you very much. Do you have some last words for people about you know getting in there? <laughs> no, thanks for for um, for listening. And if, if you want to submit a, a post, if you want to you know get your content marketing sea legs, please reach out to me. If you want to reach out? If you want to submit a post to my Moz or you Moz, or if you just want to reach out to me with a question or comment, please do so. I I love. I'm an email nut. Um, I'm on email more than I am on social media, but I love this community. I love sharing and. Um, I'm stealing from people all the time, so take what I say and use it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. And then Zapters, thank you so much for all your questions and comments and being here today. And I also have an announcement. Um, the Zap is taking a summer break, so we won't be here in July. And I just wanted to let you all know that so you won't think I fell off the edge of the earth. But I am going into my writing cave. I have a big um, book book project that I'm ghostwriting so I'm going to be concentrating on that. Ronell, this was super fantastic. Thank you. Wow, I just, you know, there's so much to write on and and for people to digest about about your loyal fans really connect not talking about them, but I think that's so important. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ronnell. All right. Ciao, everyone. Thank you.